Okay, thank you, Chief Sawa. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, want to confirm if I am audible? Yes, sir. You are. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much. Once again, good evening, everyone. And today, as part of our curriculum topic, we are going to be discussing exercise stress tests, and um, we'll be doing it. I'll be doing that um, using this outline, um, and I'll be doing that with a lot of assumptions of the fact that we all have uh, some degree of uh, understanding, knowledge, and I believe a lot of us might have even practically even conducted this test. So this is going to be a kind of uh, refresher and a reminder for all of us. So um, exercise testing is a non-invasive tool to evaluate the cardiovascular system response to exercise under carefully controlled conditions. And exercise is the body's most common physiologic stress and it places major demands on the cardiopulmonary system. Therefore, exercise can be considered as the most practical tests of cardiac perfusion as well as function. Exercise stress alone and in combination with other non-investing modalities are actually very important testing methods that uh, has high yield of diagnostic, prognostic, as well as functional information. Okay, the adaptations that occur during an exercise uh, test allow the body to increase its metabolic rates to up to greater than 20 times that of what we find at rest, and during which time cardiac output can increase as much as sixfold, and which include age, gender, body size, type of exercise, uh, such as either the individual is having an isometric or isotonic exercise also affects the, metab the response metabolic and functional response the heart tends to undergo during this exercise. Fitness also is one important factor that tends to affect the magnitude of this response and the presence or absence of uh, heart diseases. And the interpretation of this exercise test requires an understanding of exercise physiology and pathophysiology, as well as an expertise in electrocardiography. So a quick rundown about the basic principles of exercise strength testing. If I can bring, okay. Now, during dynamic exercise, there's actually an increase in energy demand and of the exercising muscle, and uh, result, and it also increases total body oxygen uptake. Now, the heart and the uh, nervous system also responds adequately. There is actually a decrease from the neural nervous system. There's a decrease in vagal tone with a corresponding increase in sympathetic tone. This will lead to an increase in heart rate, an increase in stroke volume, as well as increase in cardiac output, which that will tend to match the increase in myocardial oxygen uh, demand. Now, on the, on the coronary blood flow also, because of this increase in oxygen demand, there's dilatation of the coronary vessels and increase in coronary blood flow that will also match the increase in oxygen demand of the heart. Then peripherally, an increase in, in a complex 
interplay of both uh, the nervous system, the heart, and the every other aspect of the, the physiological control of exercise. Now, this underlines the changes that occurs in the body during uh, exercise. And these are some of the important factors that exercise stress tests tend to target and assess during uh, this test. So um, just a quick rundown, there's increase in total body oxygen uptake during exercise. The VO2 max, which is the peak oxygen uptake during uh, the, there's, there's a peak, the peak oxygen uptake increases during highest level of dynamic exercise. Like we said earlier, this is related to age, sex, heredity, exercise habits and cardiovascular status, whether there's disease or the healthy heart. The cardiac output can also increase up to four times the resting level in the upright position, and maximum cardiac output results from two to four times increase in heart rate and increase in stroke volume. The stroke volume in the healthy person also plateaus at about 40 to 60% of VO2 max, and oxygen extraction ultimately at the periphery can increase up to threefold, which is the ultimate and final endpoint of most of these changes that tend to occur just because they want to match the increase in demand, in body's demand as that is being placed upon by the strain of exercise. Now, myocardial oxygen demand is related to the heart rate, the blood pressure, left ventricular contractility, left ventricular wall stress, and the products of Heart rate and systolic blood pressure, which is referred to as the rate pressure product, has been found to be a very reliable index of myocardial oxygen demand. We shall be looking at these factors uh, shortly as the presentation proceeds. And the uh, in healthy person, coronary blood flow increases during exercise due to increased neurohumoral stimulation and release of endothelial nitric oxide. However, in atherosclerotic coronary arteries, when there's about 50 to 70% reduction in luminal diameter, this will impair peak reactive hyperemia. And when there's greater than 90% stenosis, it will reduce the resting flow, not necessarily when there's uh, an exercise. So atherosclerotic arteries often fail to dilate, and they may also constrict paradoxically with exercise. This will further decrease, cause a decrease in coronary uh, blood flow. So all this uh, mechanism now, by the time there's an atherosclerotic artery and uh, the individual is exercising, this is one of the main underlying physiologic effects that tends to be triggered during exercise stress testing that we are actually looking at in the patient, which we will see how it manifests uh, shortly on the ECG. Some of these dynamic responses, this table is quite busy uh, it, but I'll walk you through shortly. Uh, these are a table showing the dynamic response to different exercises. The two main types of exercises, acute endurance exercise and resistant exercise. So uh, the acute endurance, an example of them is high repetitive. Uh, it has high uh, repetition with low resistance. An example of them is walking or cycling, while that of uh, Resistance exercise is low repetition with high load. So an example of it is weightlifting. So the cardiac output increases in uh, endurance exercises, while in resistant exercise, the rise is relatively small in comparison. Vagal tone also, there's a diminish, diminishes in uh, endurance exercises, as well as the rise, rise corresponding rise in the sympathetic so with a corresponding increase in heart rate and left ventricular contractility, there's also an increase in sympathetic tone, no doubt, in resistant exercise also. Likewise, uh, uh, stroke volume increases. There's also an increase in smooth stroke volume in uh, resistant exercise, but that is not as significant as you find in an acute endurance exercises. So if you're looking at the skeletal muscle blood flow also, this increases up to four times in endurance exercises. There is an increase in resistant exercise also, but it is not as marked as what you find here. So the aortic outflow impedance reduces in acute endurance exercise, while 
here there's actually a reduction, but it's also not as much as what you find in uh, endurance exercises. Systolic blood pressure increases with a rise in cardiac output. We also find that in a uh, resistant exercise. But one thing to know here is that uh, this rise in systolic blood pressure is more marked in resistance exercises than what you find in endurance exercise. As a matter of fact, with uh, this is an acute response we're looking at. Chronically, we tend to find a decrease in this uh, systolic blood pressure because of the long-term cardiac adaptations most of these athletes tend to have uh, in endurance exercises. And looking at the systolic blood pressure, it either remains constant or sometimes it even falls with a reduction in vascular resistance. But remarkably, in resistant exercises, there's actually an increase with elevated uh, peripheral resistance. If you look at uh, venous return also, especially during straining, this may decrease in resistant exercise, but uh, there's little or no change you tend to find in uh, uh, endurance exercise. So uh, this is just to give us a brief uh, comparison of what the normal and the abnormal responses to stress testing is. When we do a stress testing, we expect a normal increase. Normally, the heart rate increases, blood pressure increases, cardiac output increases, there's a total peripheral resistance decrease. Uh, you find some dysrhythmias, which are manifested as isolated univocal PVCs and PACs that tend to be suppressed at with increased heart rate and increased workload. It's actually quite uh, normal to find that in, in normal individuals and therefore oxygen consumption tend to increase. Well, when you begin to see uh, the heart rate failing to rise above 120 beats per minute or enable to attain 85% of age predicted maximum heart rate is considered to be an abnormality, or there's a drop in systolic blood pressure, which we expect that is actually supposed to, to rise. That again raises a red flag, or there's a physically physical inability to complete the test. Marked hypertension. When by the time we are beginning to have a blood pressure of greater than two twenty over one ten, that is hypertensive response to exercise. That again is an abnormal. There's actually a limit to which this. Uh, blood pressure tends to rise above which we consider it uh, not beneficial and becomes harmful to the individual in the presence of chest pain or unusual uh, shortness of breath. These are abnormal responses to exercise. So moving on, we're looking at indications and uh, contraindications of this exercise. Some of the indications of exercise stress testing include detection of coronary artery disease in patients with chest pain, chest discomfort or syndromes, or potential symptom equivalent. It can also be used to evaluate the anatomic and functional severity of uh, coronary artery disease. It's also very useful in prediction of cardiovascular event and all cause death, as well as evaluation of physical capacity and effort tolerance. It can also be used in evaluation of exercise-related uh, symptoms and also assessment of chronotropic competence, arrhythmias, and response to implanted device therapy. And assessment of response to medical intervention has also been found to uh, have some good utility from exercise stress testing. Then there are actually some absolute contraindications, which include acute myocardial infections within two days, or there's an ongoing unstable angina, uncontrolled cardiac arrhythmias with hemodynamic compromise, active endocarditis, symptomatic severe aortic stenosis, or decompensated heart failure are all absolute contraindications to exercise stress testing. Acute pulmonary embolism also, and patients with pulmonary infarction or DVT, acute myocarditis or pericarditis, acute aortic dissection or physical inability that precludes safe and adequate testing are all absolute contraindications. This is a complete no, no, you cannot conduct this stress test in the presence of this, uh, in this context. But however, some of the relative contraindications where uh, there might be some form of uh, adjustment includes non-obstructive left main coronary artery stenosis, 
moderate to severe aortic stenosis with uncertain relation to symptoms. Yes, it's, uh, it's a contraindication actually, but uh, with some modification of the stress test, it can be conducted. But however, it is really not advisable to do that on, in this instance also. Tachyarrhythmias with uncontrolled ventricular rate, acquired advanced or complete heart block, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with severe resting gradient, recent stroke or transient uh, ischemic attack, mental impairment with limited ability to cooperate is also one of the relative contraindications, and resting hypertension with systolic or diastolic blood pressure greater than 220 over 110 is a relative contraindication, but to me, my own personal opinion, I, it feels to, to, to be safe. I wouldn't want to conduct subjects, anybody with a blood pressure of 200 over 110 millimeter of mercury on a treadmill test. But however, let us know that this is one of the relative contraindication. And lastly, uncorrected medical conditions such as significant anemia, important electrolyte imbalance and hyperthyroidism. So let's take a brief look at patient preparation. One, you must explain to the patient vividly and you must be conversant with the test. Sometimes it might even be useful to give a patient a little demonstration on how to go about the treadmill because that will improve the safety and outcome of the test. Patients should be advised to come in comfortable clothing and footwear. They can have a light breakfast. They should avoid, advise to avoid heavy meals. Mostly uh, it's advisable to have the last meal before the test should be at least not less than three hours. Because sometimes some of those patients are putting them on a treadmill of the full stomach might actually trigger some discomfort and sometimes will lead to vomiting. Um, especially those who don't know their drugs that they are taking, is advised to bring their drugs along so that you'll be able to take a look and see. The issue of beta blockers, uh, it, it's, it's actually advisable that it used to be advised that patients uh, should skip their beta blockers. However, there are presently quite a lot of uh, uh, contrasting views with respect to that. In fact, previously it was even suggested that patients should even skip their antihypertensive, but it has been found that that is not uh, beneficial because sometimes it tends to lead to some form of very severe rebound hypertension in in this patient. So many a times, uh, uh, what most uh, guidelines recommend is that you discuss with this patient and especially if you're looking at chronotropic competence in them, then yes, you can take away beta blockers. But if it is, you're not really bothered about chronotropic competence, you want to make diagnosis of uh, ischemia, it, it really doesn't have a significant impact on that. And uh, the beta blockers can be allowed. So again, you should advise them not to use cream or tack on the chest area on the day of the test, because uh, that could also, even though you're going to clean those areas where you're going to apply the electrodes, that can also have some effect on your electrodes uh, placement. So you advise to review, patient assessment include you should review the indications for the test, you should review patient's ability to perform the test, whether or not he has the capacity to do the test safely and uh, presence of any contraindications to the test. At this point, this is the moment where we take a look at it and decide whether or not there is either absolute relative contraindication or it is safe to conduct the test for this patient. Medical history from the patients, from the charts, review, and also from the ordering physician is also important to be taken at this point. Conduct a pre-test evaluation and do a brief physical examination. We'll talk about briefly about this pre-test evaluation. Now, this pre-test uh, evaluation has been found to if affect the outcome of stress testing, and is a very important step in uh, evaluating the patient because that will tell us whether or not this test is appropriate for the patient. If we recall, we know that the pretest probability in, in, in 
patients, it's a significant uh, factor that determines uh, whether or not the results we are going to get at the end of the day is, is, uh, rel is reliable. So uh, patients with uh, low pretest probability and high pretest probability, it is advised that alternative means of establishing diagnosis of coronary disease should be explored. It is its sensitivity and specificity are actually much more significant uh, in patients with moderate pretest probability. So uh, this chart here uh, helps us to achieve that. So uh, looking at this one on this side, typical angina is defined as presence of substantial chest discomfort of characteristic quality and duration that is provoked by exertion or emotional stress and is relieved by rest and or nitrates within minutes. So if a patient is having all three of these, you can define that person to be having typical angina. Now, if the patient meets two of only two of these criteria, it is an atypical angina or probable angina. Now, when the patient lacks or meets only one or none of these characteristics, it's a non-anginal chest pain. So we'll now take it here and match it across the different age groups and different sexes. So we'll be able to determine whether this person is having uh, uh, moderate pre-test probability, high test probability, or low pre-test probability. So we can see, for instance, in this range of uh, categories of 89, 93%, uh, this has a very high pretest probability. So when you conduct a stress test ECG among this category of, uh, of patients, in fact, it is even very risky in this category of patients to conduct stress ECG for them because the complication that might tend to arise here is actually going to be very, very high. So it's advisable to just go ahead and do a coronary angiography rather than stressing this category of, uh, of, of, of patients. And for those in this category where you see that it's white, they have a very low pretest probability. So when you do a, a stress ECG in this category of patients, the possibility of having false positive results is actually very, very high. And you're likely going to go ahead to conduct some further uh, investigation that might be expensive. And at the end of the day, might not necessarily even be necessary. So in order to improve the outcome of our exercise stress testing, this is an important step of patient uh, evaluation where we conduct a pretest probability and decide and determine whether it is appropriate to carry on with the test or not. Otherwise, except if we are trying to look at uh, other factors apart from uh, diagnosis of uh, coronary artery disease. Probably maybe we're trying to look at uh, uh, chronotropic response. We're trying to look at the blood pressure response or want to assess uh, capacity of the patient or efficacy of medications. Yes, we can still go ahead. But as far as diagnosis of uh, coronary artery disease with respect to the utility of uh, excess stress testing is concerned, this is an important uh, uh, precondition that we should not uh, overlook. So this is just an algorithm to help us to determine uh, coronary artery disease testing algorithm. So you look at the clinical presentation, evaluate cardiovascular risk factors, then you derive a pretest probability. There's a computer uh, program. I think there's an app also where you can, that can assist in doing that. So you get to enter some of those patient details. So it gives you the pretest probability, whether it is low, that is less than 15%. At this point, I uh, uh, advise not to proceed with the test. But intermediate probability between 15 to 75%, yeah, you can, can proceed with the test. High pretest probability is better to just proceed to do angiography for this category of patients. So in intermediate uh, probability, which is about 15 to 75%, uh, to assess uh, their ECG and ex exercise tolerance. If they, they have a normal ECG and they can exercise, you can proceed with their treadmill test and finally do their Duke treadmill score. If it is negative, there's no point to proceed with any other testing. By the time you do and it is, uh, it is positive, 
you can go ahead and do uh, angiography. So, but when you have an abnormal ECG or the patient cannot exercise, so again, at, at that point, you might want to begin to do some other testing that will give you an evaluation whether it is positive or not, or you proceed to do an angiography. So part of the preparation, patients should be down, uh, especially for females. Ladies can be allowed to put on their bras during exercise. And uh, the resting phase of uh, exercise for 10 minutes, you do a vital check every two minutes, materials for resuscitation. This is very important at all times, and they must be functional while conducting a stress test because yes, even though the rates of complications are actually very, very low and when you get your patient selection and patient screening uh, very well, uh, these complications are unlikely to assume, but they never can say never. Some of those are complications can occur and it can be fatal. So materials for resuscitation must be available. Stress room ventilation should be adequate, avoid air conditioner blowing directly on the patient and there should be presence of an automatic backup electricity during the procedure, the patients who are hairy on their chest uh, should be shaved because that will affect the placement of your electrodes. Uh, you should, ideally, skin prep should be conducted with fine medicals and paper. For those who have it, usually here we don't have that, so I usually use a uh, uh, usually use ventilated spirit with cotton wool to actually clean properly. You should avoid electrical interference. This will ensure good electrode contact. Always endeavor to check the expiry date of most of these electrodes. A waste belt can be applied to accommodate the electrode needs, the pick off and placement, and uh, obtain a resting ECG. We shall talk shortly more about this resting ECG. And the test is done by working on a motorized treadmill, which will start at a slow pace and usually change speed every three minutes using the Bruce protocol. So, uh, just some few words about the elite uh, placement. Um, looking at uh, this picture here uh, is an example of how lead, hello? this is an example of how lead placement should not be conducted, should not be done in exercise stress testing. If you look at it here is that the limb leads are actually on the limbs. There's one the right on the right arm, on the left, left leg, like that. Now, the problem with this uh, lead placement is that since the patient is going to be moving, actively engaging both hands and legs, most probably the hands, uh, the presence of artifacts might actually be too, too much that it might even obscure your ECG tracing that you're not likely to see. So the best way to do this lead placement is this, like this, which I'm sure all of us are conversant with. It's called the Mason Leica uh, lead placement, 12 lead placement of Mason Leica. So we converted that on the right arm and right leg, right on the right arm and the left arm to be placed uh, laterally on the front edge of the shoulders. That's the anterior data just below the clavicles, while this one is just at the uh, anterior superior iliac spinal the, along the mid clavicular line. The precordial electrodes are just the same, just like the way we do our normal uh, ECG. Uh, but there's really some little slight changes in this medicine, like a placement. It results in some slight changes in the ECG, which includes some form of right axis shift. It increases the voltages in the inferior lead. This is important, we should know, because uh, it may produce loss of inferior Q waves and development of new Q waves in, in AVL. So this uh, lead placement cannot be used to interpret a diagnostic 12 lead static ECG, meaning that by the time you fix that, uh, uh, those uh, electrodes using the mason like a uh, method, the baseline ECG that you're going to get, it is not synchronous with our usual normal uh, 12 lead static ECG. So let's talk about uh, the protocols. You need to set up termination protocols again before you proceed on the test. So one, there's the maximal exercise stress test or symptom limited uh, exercise stress test. Now, this is the preferred means to perform an exercise stress test. 
is an attempt to achieve maximal exercise workload that is tolerated by the patient. And uh, determination protocol here is based on one, patient symptoms, whether the, the patient has exercised to the point of uh, extreme fatigue, patient is tired and tells you patient wants to stop. That's at that point you need to stop. Or there's a the presence of limiting progressive angina, you need to stop. Your patient is completely out of, is getting out of breath. It's also an indication that, yes, this is, because that is why they said this was symptom limited, you need to stop. Or you begin to have some significant abnormal ECG, such as significant ST depression or elevation, or significant arrhythmias other than your normal expected PVCs and PACs. Or you are having an abnormal hemodynamic response, such as abnormal blood pressure, response so at this with this particular this in here, uh, features that you find in this protocol it's actually one of the termination criteria that you need to stop now the goal of maximal exercise stress test here is to achieve a heart rate response of at least 85 percent of maximal predicted uh, heart rate then there's the sub maximal exercise stress test also now you perform this when the goal is actually uh, is lower than that of the individual's maximal exercise capacity. And the reasonable targets are about 70% of maximum predicted heart rate, or you get, or the patient achieved uh, 120 beats per minute, or he has achieved up to about five to six metabolic equivalent of uh, exercise capacity. So this of maximal exercise stress test is used early after myocardial infarction. So, uh, in addition to that, also, there are other indications for... Uh, now, before then, it's important for me to state here that most of the times we really conduct submaximal uh, exercise stress tests. Most of what we do is the uh, maximal exercise uh, stress test. So uh, other indications for termination of exercise stress tests, there are some absolute indications. One, when there is moderate to severe antenna. Increasing nervous system symptoms like ataxia, dizziness, or near syncope, or the signs of poor perfusion, such as cyanosis or pallor, or you begin to have some technical difficulties in monitoring either the ECG or the systolic blood pressure. That is an indication for you to stop that stress test at that point in time. Or the subject has indicated his desire that he wants to stop, or you begin to have sustained ventricular tachycardia, or there's an ST segment elevation that is greater than one millimeter in leads without diagnostic key waves other than lead V1 and AVR. Then some of the relative indications include drug in systolic blood pressure of greater than 10 from baseline blood pressure, despite an increase in workload. Patient is, is uh, increasing, is the, the exercise capacity, the exercise uh, stress is increasing in intensity. You are expected that there's a corresponding increase in blood pressure, but Paradoxically, you're beginning to have a drop in that systolic blood pressure. That is actually an indication that probably this is a, pro is a, is, is, is a, is a problem for the patient, especially when you are beginning to have other symptoms, such as beginning to complain of dizziness and some other issues that you might suspect evidence of ischemia. At this point, it's advisable to stop that test. Or you have an ST or QRS changes such as excessive ST segment depression, more than two millimeter or horizontal down sloping ST segment depression, or there's a marked uh, axis shift. Again, at this point, you might consider stopping that test at that point in time. Or you're having arrhythmias other than what you consider to be normal, or the patient is fatigued, there's shortness of breath, you begin to have wheezing, leg cramps, claudication, and uh, development of bundle branch block or intraventricular conduction delay that cannot be distinguished from the ventricular tachycardia, or there's increasing chest pain, or is also having hypertensive response. These are all indications for terminations of uh, excess stress testing. Other types of protocols include, there's a stepped and there's a ramp protocol. This stepped protocol used to be conducted early days of exercise stress, I don't think most people do this step now. So there's a work rate increment. Then the RAM protocol is what we commonly do now, designed with stages that are no long, not longer than one minute and for the patient to attain peak effort within eight to 12 minutes. So this here is just 
trying to gra graphically show what the step protocol is and the ramp protocol. There's a steady increase in slope, while this one is a staggered increase uh, in slope. So the Bruce protocol said was the uh, uh, first uh, invented by this man called Robert Bruce, Robert A. Bruce, in the year 1949. He's considered as the father of exercise physiology. He published the standardized protocol in 1963, and this has been regarded as the gold standard for detection of myocardial ischemia when risk stratification is necessary. So uh, uh, this is just uh, a rundown of other protocols that uh, we have. The most commonest, like I've mentioned, and the most standardized is the Bruce protocol. The advantages include that it has been widely used in the past and is most validated on the basis of older studies. Therefore, comparisons are easier. And because the Bruce protocol has a final stage that cannot be completed, it is actually a good protocol for highly fit persons, mostly even elite athletes. I think that is the, is the Bruce protocol that they mostly use in uh, their regular assessment of fitness. And it has some disadvantages though. One is that the main disadvantage of the Bruce protocol is the large increments of change in workload between stages. These large increments mean that peak workload falls somewhere between stages for many people. This is a problem in evaluating functional capacity and may result in lower sensitivity for the test. The fourth stage of Bruce protocol is an awkward stage that can be run or worked, resulting in divergent oxygen costs and workloads. There is a modified Bruce protocol also usually developed for patients who are less fit. The modified protocol at additional stages zero and half. These stages uh, at the speed of 1.7 miles uh, per hour, which is 0% and 5% uh, grades. That's talking about the slope. They provide a lower workload for persons with poor cardiovascular fitness. However, even this work workload may be too heavy for some debilitated patients and may result in premature fatigue. The other protocols include uh, they are superior to Bruce protocol. Uh, these protocols have been they have more gradual increase in workload and can be modified to suit the individual. This includes the Norton protocol is mostly fit, mostly good for older or debilitated patients, better than what you find in modified Bruce protocol. There's the Balke protocol meant for the younger fit persons. The Cornell protocol has a wider range of fitness level depending on the starting grade you are advancing then the and the ramp uh, protocol. So this is uh, added this here just to uh help us remember because i discovered in some of these mcqs they tend to play with uh this met now you might notice here that this is reflecting 4.5 mets as uh, bruce stage one if you look at some other text you will see 4.6 i think uh, there's uh some slight uh, uh changes in some of the some will say 4.5 and some will say 4.6 but this one that i'm referencing here is actually 4.5 and i really don't know why that disparity and why the standardization is not actually done but this is uh, placed here for us to be able to look at it note the speed of various stages in Bruce protocol and their corresponding uh meds this is the boston medical center ramp protocol also i don't think this might be necessary for any memorization then exercise capacity is usually based on metabolic equivalence otherwise known as the meds um, one met is defined as 3.5 mil oxygen uptake by kilogram per minute, which is equivalent to the resting oxygen uptake in a sitting position. By the time an individual exercises and is having less than five mets, that is described as poor. While the, if the patient is having between five to eight mets, that is a fair exercise capacity. Nine to 11 mets is a good exercise capacity. 12 meds or more is an excellent exercise capacity. And each of these have a corresponding uh, prognostic uh, implication in, in, in the patient. So an inability to exercise for more than six minutes on the Bruce protocol, or there's an inability to increase heart rate to about 85% to achieve our target uh, heart rate. This 
are actually significant indicators of increased risk of coronary events. And their five year survival usually range between 50 to 72 percent. So uh, the methods uh, of excess stress testing, they said the master's two step excess test is no longer used. So we can use the treadmill, bicycle egometer, arm egometer, or pharmacological uh, method. For the purpose of our discussion today, we are going to be talking about the treadmill. We're talking about the treadmill, but it's important for us to also know that these are other uh, means of achieving exercise stress tests. This is just a depiction of the treadmill uh, uh, equipment. Uh, this is a bicycle egometer, and this is an arm. This is an arm egometer. So, uh, patient monitoring during this exercise testing is also very, very important, and as well as during the recovery period. Now, during the exercise period, the 12 lead ECG during the last minute of each stage, or at, at least every three minutes, is, should be done. Blood pressure during last minute of each stage, or at least every three minutes, should also be conducted. And the symptom rating skills as appropriate for the test indication and laboratory protocol is also uh, important to be carried out during the exercise period. We'll talk about the symptom rating protocol shortly. Now, during the recovery period, it should be monitored for a minimum of six minutes after the exercise in either a sitting or supine position or until near baseline heart rate and blood pressure with ECG and symptoms measures are reached. A period of active cool down may be included in the recovery period, particularly following high levels of exercise. This is designed to minimize post-exercise hypotensive effect of venous pooling in the lower extremities. And uh, we should the 12 lead ECG should be taken after every two minutes. Most of the softwares have come across every by the time the recovery period starts, every one, one minute is going to prompt you to check the blood pressure. And I think it also uh, taken record of that uh, uh, ECG and it prints it out for you. Then the heart rate and blood pressure immediately after exercise, then every one or two minutes until near baseline measures are reached. Symptomatic ratings every minute, as long as they persist after exercise, the patient should be observed until all these symptoms have resolved or return to baseline levels. Patient supervision is also very important. According to the guidelines, they define this level of supervision into three. One, it could be personal supervision. This requires a physician presence in the room. Direct supervision requires a physician to be in the immediate vicinity or on the premises or the floor and should be available for emergencies. Then general supervision requires the physician to be available by phone or by page. What determines what level of supervision you one will need, I think it depends on whether this patient you consider initially to be high risk, moderate risk, or low risk in conducting uh, this, this test. Plus, uh, specifically, if you think the patient is high risk, of course, obviously, you will have to uh, opt for the personal supervision where the physician is there in the room, is present at that point, should in case there's any emergency comes up, is going to be readily available to intervene. And the health personnel conducting the test must be trained in ACLS. Like I mentioned earlier, a defibrillator and other emergency medications and equipment must be present in the room. This takes us to the more technical aspects of uh, the stress testing. The data that we're going to obtain at the end of the day includes the ECG, heart rate, blood pressure, the symptoms, functional capacity. They could be quite exasperating. So uh, you need to have a good and solid understanding of what exactly you are looking out for what it means, its clinical implication and interpretation. So that's a quick uh, reminder of our normal ECG and what the J point is. We all know uh, the TP segment, this, this is the uh, ST segment, the junction between the end of the QRS and beginning of the ST segment is the J point. So this is an important, the J point is an important uh, marker for us while we are looking at the ECGs in uh, stress tests, the T-wave obviously, and 
the U wave subsequently not reflected on this uh, image. So there are quite a number of normal ECG response to excise stress testing. Looking at the QRS complex, there's a decrease in size. Likewise, the P, the interval, such as the PR interval, the QRS, the QT interval, they tend to shorten. The J point decreases. This will usually result in an upsloping of the S segment. And the ST segment usually returns to baseline by 8 milliseconds. 80 milliseconds is an av is averagely under ECG tracing paper. And the PR segment, the uh, downslope, uh, the, especially in the inferior leads, and uh, R amplitude may also decrease, particularly when we begin to achieve a heart rate of greater than 100 and per minute. P amplitude tends to increase, and uh, the T wave tends to decrease. So all these changes uh, depicted here a uh, normal ECG response to exercise uh, stress testing. So let's take a look at what uh, different ST segment changes that is likely to occur in response to exercise stress testing. Three ways. One, it can either be downsloping, upsloping, or horizontal. This is an example here of a downsloping ST segment. While here is showing us an upsloping ST segment, there is actually a depression, ST segment depression, with the downsloping ST segment. Likewise here, but the ST the G point here is upsloping, while the code, this one shows us a horizontal uh, ST segment. So let us pay attention. Each and every one of them has its significance clinically while looking at. Uh, uh, stress ECGs. So this is a normal ST segment. While here we are having a downsloping ST segment depression or a flat ST segment depression, this could connote the presence of subendocardial ischemia. While the presence of ST segment elevation, like in anywhere, it is it, it signifies transmural ischemia. Uh, the other here, one other uh, feature that is not depicted there for clinical that the clinical implication is that it is usually a normal response to exercise when you have an upsloping ST segment uh, uh, depression. So that is why it is really not uh, reflected here. Or sometimes you can have uh, T wave uh, inversions also. Um, but none. This is what where we will now look at it in ST segment depressions. When you are, when you have one millimeter or greater of either horizontal or down sloping ST segment depressions in three consecutive beats. And this depression will be relative to the PQ point, not the TP segment. Uh, and it's from 80 milliseconds after the J point. This is the diagnostic of ischemia. If there's early repolarization, then we advise to compare it to the isoelectric line. By the time we are having this one millimeter or greater, either horizontal or down sloping three consecutive beats, definitely we have made our diagnosis of ischemia. We will talk about uh, their clinical implication in the different leads that uh, we can see shortly. However, when we are having an upsloping ST segment pressures, this is really too positive. Most times it might just be the normal exercise response uh, that we tend to see on the ECGs. And ST segment elevations, like I have mentioned, by the time you are having one millimeter of rate above the P point, at 60 milliseconds start the J point in three consecutive beats. Each of them, when you're making that diagnosis, you must pay attention and be sure that these changes are occurring in three consecutive beats. Sometimes you might have one, the next one is going to be normal, or you have two, the next one, the third one will be normal, continue like that. That is not considered as being positive. You have to have three consecutive 
bits with these similar changes, either the, the elevation or the diagnostic uh, ST segment depression in three consecutive bits will be considered as a positive test. Now, if there are no previous Q waves and you're having one millimeter or greater above the PQ point, ST segment elevation, then this is a diag is diagnosis of significant coronary artery disease or coronary artery spasms. Well, if you are having at baseline, if there are Q waves, there are pathologic Q waves, this might mean that probably you are dealing with an LV aneurysm or is actually a wall mission motion abnormality, but it is not necessarily diagnostic of an ischemic response. So uh, these are typical ECG patterns that we might likely see. Uh, this is showing us at rest exercise, and this is uh, commonly the computer average uh, findings you might see. Now, if we are conversant with uh, exercise stress ECGs, you see these values. There's a first figure up and there's a first figure down here that is from the computer average figures. Now, the first one up here, tells you about the ST segment. While this one, the second one here is the slope. Now, by the time it, you can see whether it is, here is it's positive while this one is negative. Once it is negative, that means there is, it's telling you that it's actually an ST segment depression. When it is uh, positive, there's no ST segment depression. Most likely you're having uh, it's 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 going up. So this is an up sloping. This is a normal response that you see in exercise. Rapid up sloping, like we discussed about later. I mean earlier. This is a normal. This is also non-diagnostic, and you can also find uh, minor ST segment uh, depression. This is non-diagnostic because it's not the depression here is just about 0 0.9. But what we are looking for is about uh, 0 0.1. Then there can also be slow upsloping. Uh, very important to pay attention to this particular variant because if you look at it, it might want to be looking as if it's a horizontal uh, depression, ST segment depression, but it is not. So these are all normal variants of uh, ST segment changes in exercise. But if you come here and compare to these findings here, there is a significant ST depression of about 3.3 millimeter as depicted here with a flat. So the slope here is showing us that it's actually down and it is zero, three consecutive bits at least. Here we are having almost about five consecutive bits. So this is diagnostic. You can have this down sloping uh, ST segment, also diagnostic. Then elevation in non-Q wave uh ECG, there is no um, at rest, you cannot see any Q wave here. So by the time you are having this elevation, this is more than one millimeter. This is diagnostic. But this is a Q wave lead. There's actually an elevation here. So this cannot be considered as being uh diagnostic on an exercise uh, stress test. So another very important concept that we have to pay attention to again in measuring our ST segments uh, is looking at the rest ST segment, uh, uh, the resting ST segment of the ECGs. For instance, this one, in, sorry, pardon my uh, color description. I might actually be wrong about it, but it's actually looking more like red to me. This one in red here seems to be at rest. This is the resting ST segment. There seems to be some form of elevation of the J point from the isoelectric line. While in exercise, this one here in green shows the uh, depression. So by the time you're having an elevation from the isoelectric line at rest of the J point, by the time you do the exercise and you get to the depression, you're not going to calculate, you're not going to measure the ST segment depression from the initial uh, J point at rest, you're going to measure the depression from your isoelectric line. On the other hand, if there's an ST segment depression beyond the isoelectric line, and you do the exercise and there's a further depression, 
you are not going to measure the ST segment depression from the baseline. You will measure from where your initial rest ST segment is. Okay, so let's let's take a look at some baseline ECG abnormalities also that may decrease diagnostic uh, specificities in this patient. Well, first one is presence of LVH with ST segment depression greater than one millimeter. This is definitely going to affect the because we are actually looking at abnormalities in repolarization. So from the baseline already there's an abnormality of repolarization here. So it's going to affect your diagnostic specificity in making interpretations of coronary artery disease in these categories of patient. Or if the patient is having a baseline left bundle branch block, or there is a ventricular pacer in situ in the patient, or you're having a pre-excitation, for instance, you're in patient with uh, WPW syndrome, or the patient is on uh, uh, digoxin, so these are conditions that are much more commoner in older patients with a lot of comorbidities, and uh, they tend to have some, uh, com these are confounding factors that tend to decrease the diagnosis specificities. And these abnormalities, we should note that it does not actually contraindicate this uh, ECG exercise testing, but uh, what we should know is that the specificity and accuracy of our diagnosis as far as coronary artery disease is concerned is actually being altered. But however, you can do carry out this exercise to assess other parameters of uh, the exercise stress test, such as their uh, functional capacity, presence or absence of arrhythmias, and other clinical endpoints in this uh, patient. So... Measurement of ST segment uh, displacement, localization of site of myocardial ischemia. In ST segment depression, it does not actually localize the site of myocardial ischemia for us. It does not tell us which coronary artery is involved. For instance, if you are having ST segment depression in inferior leads, it doesn't tell you that the right coronary arteries are involved. However, localization capacity for ST segment elevation is actually relative specific for that territory of myocardial ischemia and coronary artery uh, uh, that is involved. And ST segment elevation in lead with abnormal Q waves, I have mentioned this earlier, is usually occurring about 30% of uh, anterior MI and 15% of inferior MI. Uh, they usually have lower ejection fraction, greater severity with greater severity of resting wall motion abnormalities and tend to have some worse prognosis. But it is not a marker of more uh, or more severe coronary artery disease, and it really indicates uh, myocardial ischemia. You can also have pseudo normalization of your T waves. Also, the T waves might be inverted at rest and later become upright with exercise. Now, these are pseudo normalization of T waves. We should pay attention that this is a non-diagnostic finding, and it's not really significant. It's, it's low in coronary artery disease prevalence populations. Uh, uh, it's it's more you find this kind of findings more in patients with uh, 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 low coronary artery disease, and it's in rare instances it will be a marker for myocardial uh, ischemia. So after the test has been concluded, you have gotten to the point where you need to stop. The next phase of that at peak X at the end of peak exercise, it heralds the recovery period, which we mentioned. And during this recovery period. So you have to monitor this uh, for a minimum of six minutes after exercise in a sitting or supine position or until near baseline heart rate, blood pressure, at near baseline heart rate and blood pressure. The ECG and the symptoms must have also uh, gotten back to baseline. And uh, sometimes you might need a period of active cool down uh, that might be included in the recovery period, particularly when you have achieved very high levels of exercise. This is usually done to minimize post-exercise uh, hypotensive effects of, very, of veins, that, of venous pooling in lower extremities. So like I mentioned, we need to be monitoring our tear fleet ECG, we monitor the heart rate, we monitor the, the blood pressure uh, every one or two minutes and also monitor the symptoms of this patient. This, particularly the heart rate and blood pressure at this recovery period and also the ECG findings are very, very important uh, prognostic and um, indices for us in making diagnosis. Now, this is just quickly to tell us about the autonomic effect of heart rate, 
during exercise. Usually at the beginning of exercise, there's a decrease in uh, uh, vagal response and the sympathetic response tend to shoot up at peak exercise. But by the time the exercise ends, there's a sharp, steep slope tends to uh, uh, occur. So we can see that this is the heart rate here that we're looking at. The heart rates tend to decrease sharply within very few minutes of exercise. So this helps us also to uh, assess, that's a very good prognostic indication in this recovery period. So when we are beginning to have an abnormal heart rate recovery, let's say for instance, in the first minute, we are expected to have at least decrease by about 12 beats per minute. And by uh, the second minute, we should have about 22 beats per minute decrease in heart rate. So when we are getting most of this uh, abnormal uh, heart rate recovery, they said is associated with an increase uh, all cause uh, mortality. Then the T wave, they normally decreases gradually in early exercise and it begins to increase in amplitude at maximum exercise. One minute into recovery, the T wave should be back to baseline. T-wave inversion is not a specific marker of ischemia, though, and it uh, may occur normally. But an increase in T-wave height by greater than 2.5 millivolts in V2 to V4 in patients with exercise-induced chest pain has been noted as a highly specific finding of ischemia. Now, if, if U-wave is upright at baseline, U-wave inversion may be associated with ischemia and uh, left ventricular hypertrophy as well as uh, valvular heart disease. But the specificity of these uh, findings are not actually very, very uh, high. But it's important for us to note those points also. Hello. Then that increases the probability for ischemia. Number one, if you have more number of leads, for instance, if you have uh, more than, uh, if you just have one lead, that is showing you diagnostic ECG changes. It has less probability of ischemia than when you are having maybe two, three or more leads showing you diagnostic ECG changes of ischemia. And the workload at which this ST segment depressions occur, the more, the higher, the by the time you are having this ST segment depressions in lower workload as compared to higher workloads, then of course, the probability of ischemia uh, is on sloping. is actually much more higher probability than when you are having a horizontal slope. And the ST segment adjustment relative to heart rate cause, also cause, called the ST heart uh, rate index. It usually, it's supposed to be less than uh, 1.6 microvolts uh, per minute or so. So by the time you are beginning to have a higher ST heart rate index, also the probability for ischemia is also very high. Then the amount of time in recovery before the normalization of ST segment. Now, for instance, if you uh, during the recovery period, usually by the third minute in normal individuals, you are expected to have normalization of all the changes, including the ECG changes, the heart rate must have normalized to baseline, uh, uh, the recovery for uh, blood pressure must have also been complete by third minute. So by the time you have an uh, increase in time, maybe you have got it have to get to six minutes or beyond before you get the normalizations of your ST segment changes. It increases the probability of your ischemia. And changes in the lateral lead, particularly V5, they are more specific than any other leads. Now, it's very important to also note here that isolated changes in inferior leads are likely to be false uh, positive. This is because of uh, the influence of atrial repolarization in this lead. So if you are seeing uh, ST segment depression that is isolated only to the inferior lead, I think a lot of caution is being sounded here in interpreting those uh, findings as being positive as far as uh, coronary artery disease is concerned. So other non-ECG observations, including blood pressure, we've uh, talked about that much earlier. It's expected that you should have an increase in blood pressure. If uh, you're beginning to have a decrease in blood pressure, this will tell you that probably you're having a left ventricular dysfunction or some abnormalities in your systemic vascular resistance. Then uh, exertional hypotension can also occur, and this ranges from about 3 to 
is actually higher in patients with uh, triple vessel disease or left main coronary artery disease, patients with cardiomyopathies, cardiac arrhythmias, vasovagal vaso reactions, LVOT obstruction, or those on antihypertensive medications, hypovolemia and prolonged vigorous exercise can also give us exertional hypotension. And work capacity can also be assessed in these patients. And uh, when there is limited work capacity, this is usually associated with increased risk of cardiac events in either known or suspected coronary artery disease patients. In estimating this functional capacity, the amount of work performed uh, should be the parameter measured and not the number of minutes of uh, exercise. So we've talked about I've talked about the submaximal uh, exercise earlier on. It's actually uh, a non-diagnostic test. Mostly you use it in patients with maybe peripheral vascular disease, whether that's how they have orthopedic limitations, neurological impairments, or they tend to have some poor motivation. Inappropriate increase in heart rates at low exercise workloads can also happen in patients with atrial fibrillation, physically, those who are physically deconditioned, are hypovolemic, they are anemic, or they have some marginal left ventricular uh, function. So uh, you can also have chronotropic incompetence. That is heart rate increment per stage of exercise that is less than normal, or the peak rate is below predicted at maximal workload. This usually occurs in Sinus nose disease, use of beta blockers, or compensated congestive cardiac failure and myocardial ischemic response. There's this rate pressure product also, which is uh, an important uh, and indirect measure of myocardial oxygen demand, is gotten by the product of heart rate and systolic uh, blood pressure. It's used to characterize cardiovascular performance. Then you can assess chest discomfort also. Usually, sometimes it occurs after the onset of the ischemic ST segment depression. In some patients, it may be due to only, it might be the only signal of obstructive coronary artery disease that uh, you might get. And chest discomfort occurs less frequently than ischemic, ischemic ST segment uh, depression. So, the diagnostic use of uh, exercise testing, we are looking at sensitivity and specificity now. So both of them varies with population being tested. That is uh, why it is important that we look at the pretest probability. So the evaluation of a patient at intermediate, uh, the evaluation of a patient at intermediate risk with an atypical history, that is the, the pretest probability now is between 30 to 70%. Patient at low risk with a typical History, what you it pretest probability about 30 to 70 percent. Now, this is a diagram that shows the sensitivity and specificity of uh, different uh, groups of patients. Now, in coronary artery disease, the sensitivity is about uh, 68 percent, while specificity is about 77 percent. While in single vessel disease, the sensitivity is about 25 to 71 percent. Uh, L, the LAD is more than the left coronary, the right, the RCA, and is greater than the left circumference uh, vessel. While in multi vessel coronary artery disease, tend to have higher sensitivity than the specificity, and left main or triple vessel disease also have a higher sensitivity but a much lower uh, specificity. There's something we talk about uh, the Bayes theory, which is one of the main limitations of this test. Uh, the probability of a positive test result is usually affected by the likelihood of a positive test result among the population that has undergone the test, which is uh, the pretest probability we've been talking about earlier. So the higher the probability that the disease is present in a given individual before a test is ordered, the higher is the probability that a test result is uh, true, is true positive. So this is just a summary of the Bayes theory. No Coronary causes of ST segment depression also exists, and uh, we should also note that that will include severe aortic stenosis, severe hypertension, cardiomyopathy, anemia, hypokalemia, severe hypoxia, digitalis use, and sudden excessive exercise, which is why we have talked about earlier in some of those conditions that if they exist before at baseline, they might actually interfere with 
your interpretation of your ST segment changes with respect to coronary artery disease uh, uh, diagnosis using the exercise treadmill test. Some of them include glucose load, left ventricular hypertrophy, hyperventilation, mitral valve prolapse, severe volume overload, and supraventricular tachycardia. Then the adverse prognosis, uh, prognostic disease includes duration of symptom. By the time you're having a duration of symptoms that is actually limiting at less than six minutes, this could not adverse prognosis and the presence of multivessel coronary artery disease. And or there's a failure to increase systolic blood pressure about above 120, or there's a sustained decrease of more than 10 millimeter mercury uh, during this exercise, or you begin to have ST segment depression more than two million, more than five liters, and is persisting greater than five minutes into recovery period. So these are just uh, trying to put up together most of these parameters that we might actually get. And by the time we are getting all these ones at the same time, it connotes adverse prognosis in the individual and the possibility of multivessel coronary artery uh, disease. Likewise, when you're having exercise induced ST segment elevation, excluding AVR, or you have angina pectoris as low exercise workloads or sustained uh, reproducible uh, ventricular tachycardia. So, uh, we can also use exercise testing in determining prognosis, particularly after myocardial infarction. This is uh, the treadmill test is useful to determine risk stratification and assessment of prognosis, functional capacity, and also the assess the adequacy of the patient's uh, medications after hospital discharge. Uh, you can also look use it to assess cardiac arrhythmias and other conduction disturbances like ventricular premature contraction usually occur frequently during exercise testing and it increases with age. It is though useful to note that this is not a useful marker of coronary artery disease, especially when it occurs in the absence of ischemic ST segment depression. So in left bundle branch block, exercise induced ST segment depression is found in most patients and cannot be used as a diagnostic of, or prognostic indicator. Indicator. While in right bundle branch block, exercise induced ST segment depression, particularly in its V1 to V4, is a common finding and is also non diagnostic of coronary artery disease. Presence of SVT is also non diagnostic of, of coronary artery disease. In pre excitation syndrome, disappearance of delta waves occurs while uh, in exercise, usually in about 20 to 50% of cases. When there is an abrupt disappearance, it's shows that this is a good prognosis. While the presence of WPW syndrome invalidates the use of ST segment analysis, I've mentioned that earlier as a diagnostic method for detecting coronary artery disease. So special clinical applications, digitalis produce exceptional ST segment depression, likewise uh, hypokalemia, anti-ischemic therapy also prolongs the time of onset of ST segment depression. It increases exercise tolerance and it normalizes exercise ECG response in about 10 to 15 percent of patients. And patients with uh, heparin therapy it also increases total exercise uh, duration. In women, the sensitivity and specificity are actually less than as compared to men. And uh, the false, they usually have a lot of false positive tests due to greater release of catecholamines during exercise that is being produced as a result and that usually produce vessel constriction. And this, they said, is more common during the amenses or pre-ovulation. In hypertension, in hypertension, in pneumotensive asymptomatic individuals, it increases, there's increased long-term, increased long-term risk is found in increase in systolic blood pressure greater than 214 millimeter mercury, or increase systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure at the third minute of recovery. So severe systemic hypertension can cause exercise-induced ST depression in the absence of atherosclerosis, and exercise tolerance is usually decreased in patients with poor blood pressure. In the elderly, they tend to have cardiac arrhythmias, chronotropic incompetence, and hypertensive response more commonly, while in diabetic patients, uh, because of the autonomic dysfunction and Sensory neuropathy, their angina threshold might actually 
also be increased. So they you might they might have patients who are actually if they were not diabetic, probably because of the coronary artery disease, they might have started manifesting with those angina symptoms as compared earlier as compared to patients who are, are diabetic. And after Cap G, this could indicate uh, graft occlusion stenosis or progression of the coronary artery disease. That's the utility of this exercise stress test. Or after percutaneous coronary angiography, in symptomatic patients, six months post procedural test allows us to diagnose uh, risk stenosis. So, uh, complications of this test is usually generally described as a safe procedure. Uh, and uh, though the complications tend to occur, but quite minimal, like I said, especially when the initial preparation and uh, patient selection is optimal. Uh, in a study, uh, sudden cardiac death was found in about zero to five per hundred thousand tests, which is just about zero point zero zero five percent. Another complication rate, like hospitalizations, which include arrhythmias, is was less than zero point two percent. Acute MI was found in about zero point zero four percent, and sudden cardiac death is zero point zero one percent. So you can see that overall, uh, the complication in this test, particularly if it is done meticulously and appropriately, is very, very low and almost insignificant. So some of the guiding principles while doing this test, number one, they said we should it's better to err on the side of caution. So when you think your instinct tells you that there is a need to stop this test, it's better to go ahead and stop the test. And do not be uh, your threshold for calling out for help to also be very high. You should always, at the back of your mind, consider, you said, the bad stuff, like left main disease, severe aortic stenosis, or maybe in the presence of uh, ventricular tachycardia, particularly when you're having uh, difficulty in uh, monitoring the ECGs. And uh, you should also maintain adequate communication between referring clinicians, emergency department, and cardiology, and other emergency services. So uh, complications include Good. The cardiac complications might have you might have include bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, hypotension, syncope, and shock. And death could also occur, but like I said, it's actually very, very rare. Non-cardiac complications include the musculoskeletal trauma, soft tissue injury. We could have other miscellaneous uh, complications like severe fatigue, malaise. Sometimes this might persist for days. Uh, you can have dizziness, body aches, and delayed feeling of uh, illness. So uh, it can also be used as a prognostic marker in most of these patients, exercise stress tests. So the, and the strongest predictor of prognosis is usually the functional capacity of uh, the patient, and the weakest predictor is usually the ST depression. There are a lot of other uh, parameters that and um, scores that can be used in uh, making uh, estimating this prognostic uh, index in patient. But one of the most commonest and the most used is the Duke's treadmill prognostic score. And it's calculated as the exercise time minus five times ST segment depression minus four times the angina index. So angina index can be graded as zero, one, or two. Either there is no angina during exercise being zero or uh, one, when there's non-limiting angina, or two, when there's exercise-limited uh, angina. So by the time you calculate this, and you have uh, a score of greater than or equals to five, the patient is said to have uh, is low risk, it has some good functional capacity. Uh, when it's plus four to minus 10, that means it's decreasing backward, it's moderate risk, and less than or equals to minus 11 patient is considered as uh, high risk. So this uh, uh, is actually a chart also that shows that separates the prognostic score for both uh, men and women. Quite uh, handy, I find this. So for, for, for men, uh, you can score this based on uh, maximal heart rate, depending on what your maximal heart rate is, and what the patient maximal heart rate is. So you can score it here. 
and uh, at the end of the day get uh, the total score. So uh, if the exercise test score for men is less than 40, this is considered low probability, 40 to 60 intermediate probability, greater than 60, there's a high probability, while in women also using this uh, chart to be able to tell us uh, their classifications of prognostic uh, value. The box scale also is, is one of the rating of perceived exertion that is used. It's widely used as a reliable indicator to monitor and guide exercise intensity. The scale allows individuals to subjectively rate their level of exertion during exercise or exercise uh, testing. It was developed by Gunnar Bock, often referred to as the Bock scale. There's also the modified Bock Disney scale, which is most commonly used to assess symptoms of breathlessness. So this is just, uh, this is the original Bock scale rating from 6 to 20, and uh, it can be used to rate the passive exertion. While this is the reverse box scale with rate of about zero to 10. So we can classify those patients as either at rest, whether it's really easy, easy, moderate, soft, hard, like that, until when you get to uh, the maximum. So in writing a report, at the end of the day, you collate all this data from the ECG, the uh, the exercise capacity, blood pressure changes, and every other parameters you've gotten. So the, a, a comprehensive report of a treadmill test should include the exercise protocol that was used, the duration of exercise, peak treadmill speed and the grade, the peak workload in MET or VO2 max, the functional capacity of the patient, maximal heart rate percentage of uh, age predicted maximal heart rate, resting and peak blood pressure, the symptoms that was encountered, presence or absence of arrhythmias, and as well as the ECG changes. So these are all should be all encompassing in a treadmill test uh, results. So in conclusion, there's a convincing evidence that treadmill score enhanced diagnostic and prognostic power of exercise stress exercise uh, treadmill tests, and this certainly has costs and efficacy implications, particularly when you compare it with how much it costs to have an angiography. And if this uh, is adopted, the proper methodology is adopted, is uh, actually very important for safety and also help us to obtain accurate and comparable results. The use of specific criteria for exclusion Termination interaction with subject and appropriate emergency equipment noted that is very essential, especially when trying to minimize improve sensitivity and specificity of the patient, improve diagnostic accuracy, and to also minimize uh, complications. Thank you very much. These are my references. Wow. Wow, this is brilliant. I just feel like we can have electronic hands to clap and for you, sir. That was quite excellent and quite detailed. This is one of the first uh, stress ECG presentation that I've seen that was quite detailed. Thank you for the extensive work you did. Thank you for putting so much to bring this vital information to us, particularly for those going for exam and for others for their technical practice. So now the floor is open for contributions, questions, clarifications. If you don't want to speak up, you can type it in the chat box and let's have it. We have a few minutes to do this. So in no particular order, we can start. Please, if you want to say anything, you can just either unmute your mic and speak, raise your hand up and speak. The floor is open. Thank you again, Dr. Sal. Wonderful presentation. That's quite just I was just excited about. Thank you, sir. I was actually scared. Really, I bought a lot of people um, with so many. One, exercise stress test is something very boring and annoying. And, um, it could make a lot of sense when you do it practically. 
Mm. And uh, it right. reinforces a lot of this. Uh, so many other informations, index here, there. I try to sweep a lot of them out, but uh, the essential ones, particularly when I noted that a lot of them, they played around with them in MCQs. But I hope mm. at the end of the day, is, you find it useful. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, and just the way you said, if not for the fact that we have opportunity to do exercise, stress is just some of the things may just be abstract. But you did a very good job. It's actually for me, even if we didn't, even if we're not doing it, you actually went to town to help us to get it. Even it looks very abstract, you don't have it, but you did very well to make it very clear. Please, the floor is open. Can we please speak up? You can't listen to this okay, video. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, good evening everyone. Good evening, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um mine is just um a, a patient I saw. So I want to know if um thank you so much, um Dr. Sawa, for this um detailed presentation as you usually do. So okay, so my question um is I actually saw a twenty-six year old male who is not hypertensive, neither is he living with um DM. So he actually did um, an ECG that showed um, a left ventricular hypertrophy alone. That's all I could relate on that ECG. But um, his complaint was um, chest pain and um, exertional dyspnea. There's, however, a positive history of um, use of illicit drugs. So what he did was a rest, um, a rest ECG or a resting ECG. So I don't know, is it advisable for me to send this patient to do a stress ECG? When I examined him, um, I actually realized that he had um, thickened arterial wall, he had locomotor brachialis. Um, the apex bit was actually displaced, as um, what the ECG said, that he had an LVH. But he kept on complaining of chest pain and exertional dyspnea. Is it advisable for me to send this patient to the stress ECG? Although I sent him to do an echo, am I supposed to send to the stress ECG since the rest of the ECG did not show any um, ischemic changes? I don't know, just um, asking. I, I was not here from the beginning of the lecture. I was having network issues. Thank you. Okay. Should I answer the questions as they come or we'll take them? <laughs> Just go ahead, sir. If we wait for oh. others, just go ahead. Okay, all right. Yes, how old did you? Let me confirm the age of this patient again. He's 23, 23 year old male. Okay, 23 year old male. If you look at yeah. uh, this, our pre test probability uh, scale. That is why we said it's it's very important that we carry out this pretest probability because at the end of the day, it's going to affect the outcome of our test. So that chest pain that is having, first we need to categorize it, whether it is a typical angina, a typical angina or non-angina. So in determining this, does he have a substantial chest discomfort of characteristic quality and duration? Is this discomfort provoked by exertion or emotional stress and also relieved by rest and or nitrate within minutes? So if he is having three of these features, that means he's having typical angina. If the patient is having only two of these, is atypical angina. And if he's having none of this, is non-angina chest pain. So moving on to this chart here on the left by age group. So what this chart is even reflecting here is population age group between 30 to 39. For typical uh, angina, the probability is about 59% in men. But he is 23. So this is obviously going to be much, much lower than the what you were having here. So if it is an atypical angina, you can see that the probability, pretest probability has even decreased further. Then what's more, if it is a non-angina chest pain, it has even decreased much lower. You can go ahead to do 
distress ECG for the patient. But I think it is important to look at other possible causes, probably non exclude other non cardiac causes of chest pain in this young man. But uh, because putting in mind that the likelihood of having a false positive result is high in him. And by the time you do that stress ECG and you get that false positive, you might start getting agitated. You want to start sending him to go and do a coronary angiography. And you might know because of the cost and everything, you will know the, the devastating impact. I remember one patient we did uh, stress ECG for. By the time it was positive and they told him, okay, this is the next step you are going to do. By the time they just call the cost for the patient, suddenly he, this was a patient who was uh, lively and was talking and we were just saying, by the time he had the cost, he just started having some sweating in the forehead. And I think he started becoming dizzy. He had to quickly rush and make him sit down and make him calm down and start diverting the talk and making him a little bit much more comfortable. So that is just to tell you, the amount of anxiety it might actually generate. So my advice in this patient is being the fact that he is likely to have a very low pretest probability. Perhaps it might be much more useful clinically to exclude other non-cardiac causes of chest pain before you subject him to a exercise treadmill test. I don't know if any other person has a much more illuminating response to this. Thank you. I think you basically answered what she said, except that she asked for the questions. Dr. Florence, are you clear? Yes, I am. Thank you. All right, that's very perfect. Um, who is Kati? I, I don't know if we can help out most times. We should come in with our names because we don't know the link can spread and we have uh, intruders. Who is Kati? Hello, Kati, can you make comments? Oh, Kathy's not here. Jay, are you there? That's what you can do or something, Jeremiah. All right, so maybe next um, session we might remove those with um, incomplete. I'm here, sir. Oh, what's your full name? Sorry. Jeremiah, are you Ganji? Okay. There was one person we gave pulmonary embolism text. So perhaps, I don't know if she's here now in her full name or full capacity. Is there any other further questions, clarifications before we um, really, really thank Dr. Sarah? Very brilliant presentation. Any other person, please? From the chat box, a whole lot of persons saying thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for such a your presentation. All right. Um, let me call those going for exam for their comments. Yes, you have questions to ask. Dr. Ayodeji, over to you. Ayodeji Stevens. Ayodeji. All right, Dr. Alex, it will be. Hello, Chief. Yeah, make your comment. If you have something to say before this exam, from this. Eh, uh, well, let me just ask, uh, Chief. I don't know. I need, uh, as a nurse staff, like a uh, 40 year old, two, he has the uh, like non exertional chest pain, non exertional chest pain. And when we did the ECG, I uh, he had this two way inversion in V1 to V3. The troponins that we did were just, uh, 39, 39, so the, the reference was uh, less than 30. So I don't know, this kind of patients, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure it will benefit from uh, non exertional uh, Most time, according to her, we live with rest, not with, uh, medication or rest, I mean, not with medication. So what do you suggest, Chief? Okay, this, the, you said the troponins were elevated, but they not are not 39, to... 39, 
uh, just borderline 39. The borderline was uh, the reference was should be less than 30. The proponent for uh, what, what was the ECG findings baseline? It was just uh, the, the two wave inversion in V1 to V3. Okay, I know another thing that we can also pay attention to again is uh, the presence of, of uh, myocarditis. Myocarditis can give you some non characteristic ECG changes as well as uh, elevation in troponins that might not reach diagnostic threshold for coronary artery disease. Uh, so, so I will want to first and so foremost evaluate uh, these patients to be sure that you didn't get any issue of maybe prior fibrinus okay. or any flu like you didn't get that there's no issue of such okay fine as long as you exclude because uh you cannot subject a patient to treadmill tests in if the, who has myocarditis as long as you can exclude myocarditis that's my point you can go ahead and and stress the and stress the patient better still if you have uh, access to a strain imaging i didn't mention that that is one uh, very useful uh, diagnostic test we also do as a prelude to our exercise treadmill test also you can also do a, a a strain imaging on the patient and that is going to give you a tremendous amount of uh, idea with respect to what is actually happening in the myocardium and whether or not you're going to have a, a useful information from exercise stress test exercise stress testing is good very important but the fear in these patients for me is i will want to first and foremost exclude the possibility of him having a myocarditis otherwise i will go ahead and stress him okay okay Chips. thank you you're welcome thank you so much dr Ayodeji. dr alex it will be over to you just take two more one more question oh good Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sawa, for the very excellent presentation. Um, just to add that part of the things that we take as precautions to ensure accuracy and safety of the tests, um, apart from wearing comfortable clothing and shoes during the exercise, is to ensure that our patients stay well hydrated before the test. And then other things is that they have to inform the health provider if they are taking any other medication uh, because that may need to be temporarily stopped uh, before the test. And then um, also to avoid the they should avoid heavy meals and um, or use of caffeine before the test because these can have effects on uh, the heart rate and then blood pressure um, in the patients. Now, the other thing I wanted to just mention on is that um, while the stress ECG is a very valuable diagnostic tool, it, it also has some drawbacks that we should um, consider. So there are some limitations to the use of stress ECG. Okay, because sometimes you can have false positive results they can have uh, false negative results in them too. And then occasionally, sometimes the results may even be inconclusive in some of the uh, patients. So it's important to have this in mind, to know that it's not um, just always absolute when we do it, but we, we, we need to have that um, in mind as well as we do the test to collaborate with other things, clinical features, uh, previous ECG results before the test and after the test, comparing all of the parameters put together and um, the um, risk or the probability like um, Dr. Sawa had mentioned earlier. Thank you very much once again for a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Alex, for that very good contribution.
Dr. Sorry Conte, can we get your question or contribution, please? Conte. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah. Just want to once more thank um, Dr. Sawa for a wonderful presentation. I think um, the the important, you know, critical aspects that we've seen coming up in MCQs, he has highlighted and emphasized very well, uh, especially when you come to the various types of ST segment elevations, those uh, ST segment depressions those that have significance for ischemia and those that are exercise induced. I think he brought them out very well. And also very important are the absolute contraindications and uh, relative contraindication. I think it was a very good presentation. This will be very, very useful material for us. And we hope these slides will be uploaded soon so we can just go over and consolidate the idea. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Absolutely. I'll provide the slides shortly as soon as we end this. I will share it on the, the group chat. Yes, please. This is, this, this, I think, um, in our exam, we had just like, one question of stress. But I don't know this one. You know, it might just be more, but this is very, very excellent. So to keep the flow balanced, we call on the last female to speak. Alison. Please, can you say something okay for the um, exam sub the survivor? Alison, over to you. Yes, Chief Bukopi. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Sawa. I don't think I have anything to say than to say thank you to him for this presentation. Thank you. Most of the things have been said. Only if I just have to mention that um, the test might not be as easy as we think, um, especially to get a good um, report uh, to absent or devoid of um, artifacts. We need to do her skin preparations very well. I think that's just all. Because if not, um, art art artifacts might actually not allow us to get a good um, report. Thank you so much, Dr. Sawa. Thank you. Thank wow. you, Mom. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Sao. I remember last year, um, April May exam, they brought stress ECG report for the viva for them to report, give a um, full report. They stated all the blood pressure response and code. So um, I don't know if you can help the house. And you know, I've read your report on stress ECG, very beautiful. If you can give us a it was the summary, your conclusion you gave, um, mm -hmm. how is the component of the stress ECG report. If you can give us an example of a positive and a negative report. So people here can see it as templates. Should they have um, such findings in the exam? Just the way they brought last year, printing, they brought ECG of stress ECG and they asked them to report. Report it, say something about it. So if you can help, Possibly something like that, so that we can have that as template for this as part of the slide. I don't know if can help. Can help. Okay, so I'll 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 do that as soon as I get access to the. I was actually planning to do to get the, but I didn't really wasn't able to go to retrieve those results uh, to add to, as part of this presentation. But I will definitely do that maybe subsequently and before the week runs out and upload. Okay some of those results. Okay, wow, thank you so much. Sawa has very brilliant report on stress ECG in our team. We'll call him the professor of the J point. So he has done very brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sawa, very excellent. Thank you. Thank you for being a good person too. You did a great job, thank you. Um, Dr. Allison, we'll hand over the class now to you, your next time. So we'll start the soft child survival. Um, we're sharing it. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Yeah, we'll start with the social survival. I shared the questions on the page. So if you are available to take your, your part, please, let's have you. So let someone share the, 
it's like but meanwhile let me just say some good um stuff this is the this badge you guys have broken a whole lot of records now we are waiting for a record success really i've never seen the speed you guys accomplished in this short time and the brilliance is something else i'm just seeing positive vibes i'm seeing positive outcomes already from this yourself very excellent very determined and we're going to have great success i'm praying for you guys but i know it's very time. so let's keep the fire going let's keep it going sincerely this is great i also i've been so happy so excited my desire is to have 100 percent pass and i believe that's all i desire. so let's let's be resilient let's keep it going so we'll share the questions and then we'll have those that are ready to take their part. For those that are not ready, we can take it 